Democracy Matters is Danielle Pletka. Uh, before I introduce her, I, I just want to say a, a few words about uh, this conversation series. Democracy Matters is um, a production of Canada's McDonald Laurier Institute. Um, we are focusing on safeguarding democracy, the future of the free world, countering this resurgence of authoritarianism around the world. And we've had uh, five conversations so far, uh, sort of a pilot, and soon we will be scaling up to a higher pace and we will be available as a podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, very grateful to the guests we've had so far, especially because they've taken a chance on us. Um, and uh, we're moving past this uh, pilot or incubation phase. So I'm grateful to anyone who has advice or suggestions to offer, including about um, guests for us to host here. Um, so also just want to say a bit of thanks to uh, people at the McDonald Laurier Institute who've uh, helped me with this, particularly Brett Byers, uh, Jaslyn Melnichuk, and Eric Stoppelman. I'm very thankful to all of you guys. Um, so my guest today, uh, Danielle Pletka, is a woman I admire so very much. Um, she is a Distinguished Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on um, defense and foreign policy studies. Previously, she was Senior Vice President at AEI, uh, uh, focused on all of the um, democracy, uh, all of the foreign and defense policy uh, studies at the think tank. Previous to that, she was a senior staff member of the Foreign Relations Committee of the United States Senate. Uh, Danny, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, Mariam, and, and kudos back to you. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so Danny, you may not remember this, but the first time I met you was uh, not here in DC, but um, in Warsaw, Poland in 2007 at a meeting of the Council for the Community of Democracies. And I wanna kind of take you back to that time, the George W. Bush administration and where we were with <laughs> policy supporting <laughs> democracy and, um, and uh, in, in more generally the free world and how it was um, looking at the future of democracy in the world. How, how have things changed in your view? since then? Uh, well, you could see me sigh. Uh, and I remember that uh, because our mutual friend Bronek was the, was in fact the, the head of the, the community of democracies. Uh, you know, look, I think this, this says everything. Um, the president of the United States, President Biden, uh, recently talked about the vital importance of democratic norms of spreading democracy around the world. People have talked about how it might be wise, maybe, maybe you know, in the face of aggression from Russia and from China, we should really have a group of, of democracies. And it's like, you know, there was a community of democracies. It still exists. You pay for part of it, but you don't actually do anything with it and you barely know it exists. So I think that really sort of encapsulates the problem. They, the, the, commitment to, the commitment to democracy from this administration, certainly the previous administration, but even worse, the sort of explicit repudiation of what in the Bush administration was called the freedom agenda mm -hmm. by Obama is, is really, it encapsulates where we are, which is, we talk about it sometimes, but as a matter of sort of national priorities, the words have nothing to do with the policy. Yeah, and you've written, well, you've written extensively, and of course, you're a, a regular um, guest on Meet the Press, which is um, America's longest running news program, and I'm always uh, struck, especially when compared to other commentators, about how honest you are. Um, in particular, I, I think that what d distinguishes you from many other commentators is that when you look at American foreign policy in particular um, and comparing the um, Biden slash Obama approach versus the Trump approach, you're very critical of Trump in, in many ways, but when it comes to how he uh, projected American power 
and protected U.S. interests, I think that you're able to hold both, thing, both things in your hand to say that, well, Trump was really bad on, on all of this, but, but so much better than Obama-Biden on this. Can you explain more about that, where you sit on all those? Sure. I mean, look, I think you need to think about things differently when, when it comes to the Trump administration. And let's start with them first. Um, you know, there's Donald Trump, the person, a hard man to admire, a hard man to like, a very hard man to listen to. And um, and then there's the Trump administration's policy where what my podcast co-host uh, Mark yes. Thiessen calls, um, you know, the Trump administration on mute was actually a pretty good administration. Tough on Russia. Now, again, if you listen to the president, you know, he thought Putin was, seemed to be a great guy, really liked Erdogan, you know, really thought Xi Jinping had a good system there going for him. But if you if you just sort of shut the president up in your mind, something I know we all wish that we could do more often, then tough on Russia, tough on China, a very interesting and different vision of the Middle East that I think, frankly, a lot of us were very skeptical of in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but but fundamentally, very positive about American leadership and American power. Now, I want to differentiate that from what we talked about at the outset, which is that um, the Trump administration was not good on democracy. Now, when I say that, I mean that they were not good on, on, the, on what we call the freedom agenda. They were not good on pressing. Can you hear the dogs in the background? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> they were not good on, on pressing the case for human freedom. On the other hand, they were much better about talking about those issues, talking about the freedom of the Syrian people, talking about the freedom of the, of the Iranian people, talking about the rights of the Chinese people, much better on that. Hang on a second. Let me yell at the dogs. Hey, stop it. As an aside, I taught at Georgetown during the during you know the, the worst of the pandemic, and my entire class got to know the bloody dogs because all I do is scream, I have to scream at them, but I hate to crate them up, and they're just horribly badly trained, which tells you something about me. But um, <laughs> in any case, uh, in any case, so there was there was that. And I think a lot of us appreciated that, even as we didn't appreciate um, the, uh, even as we didn't appreciate the the rhetoric that went along with it. Now you take the the Obama Biden administrations, yes. and when Obama came to power, he came to power explicitly repudiating the freedom agenda. And you remember this: he went to Cairo in 2009 and he gave a big speech, and he basically said, "If I may put it in the vernacular, we don't give a crap about democracy or human freedom. We're not going to be interfering in your domestic affairs. You know, we're really about nation building here at home. You know, not not about not about your lives." For a lot of people, that was really pretty shocking, but I think it characterized the Obama administration and people forget this, but they cut funding for democracy activities across the board, State Department, AID, radios, everything, right? They stopped emphasizing the issues and it really was a reflection of the Obama administration's values. The Biden administration, I think, is largely the same administration. It's the same people. It's the same lack of values in foreign policy. And while I'm grateful to Joe Biden for talking about this and for giving a speech about the importance of democratic norms, the reality is his administration hasn't done squat. Yeah. So it's a it's a contrast between talk and style and substance. You're saying on the substance, on the policy, Trump was much better on the issues that we're talking about, about foreign policy, about actual what it takes to hold uh, the most repressive regimes uh, more to account, uh, even if he's not out there talking about democracy. So you talked about him being hard on Russia. Can you say more? And then we can segue into where we are today with the Ukraine, with Ukraine. So look, let's let's just start in, in 2014. In 2014, the Russian forces entered. They took Crimea, which is Ukrainian territory. And they annexed it. What were the consequences? Honestly, absolutely nothing. The imposition of a few sanctions, the uh, uh, a couple of vocal complaints, but you know, 
no, none of the sort of speeches that you're seeing now, basically no reaction from NATO. And um, I've told this story more than once now, but I still remember sitting uh, in our conference room and talking to a very senior German Bundestag, um, a foreign affairs official. And he said, I won't do the accent, even though I'm tempted. What should we do for Ukraine? What do we care about Ukraine? Yeah, They suck. Uh, and you're really asking me to stand up for that government? No, don't care. Look, no joke, what he said. Um, so we get that message. And there were sanctions imposed, but they all came from Congress. In other words, Congress gave the administration no choice but to impose certain sanctions. Then we get to the Trump administration. Again, president, soft on Putin, clearly likes a, a dictator, you know, really rhetorically un, unappealing. And I would say in, in his mental processes, just every bad and wrong instinct that you can imagine to yourself, but absolutely wouldn't put up with the kind of garbage that Obama would put up with, right? No, you can't do this. No, you know, chemical weapons in Syria are not okay. No, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're not going to tolerate you doing this. No, you can't interfere in our elections. One of the things that Trump never talked about, uh, but was, I think, very notable, and he, he, he finally admitted to it on a, a podcast that he did with me and, and Mark Thiessen, um, uh, where Mark asked him directly, did you launch a cyber attack against the Russians for their interference in the 2018 Trump midterm elections? And the answer was, yes, they did. Absolutely. Now, you know, when we not talk about election interference in 2016, the Obama, the Obama administration did absolutely nothing. But the Trump administration actually did. Ditto with sanctions, ditto with going after their various violations. They were much tougher, imposed more sanctions. I would say the harshest sanctions we'd seen on Russia since the end of the Cold War. And that all happened under Trump. Okay, so do you think that if Donald Trump uh, continued to be president, was elected to a second term, uh, Putin would have invaded Ukraine as he has? You know, Trump says he never would have thought of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, none of us know. Sure. You like to think that Trump presented certainly a, a more unpredictable, <laughs> very unpredictable um, uh, leadership. And that meant that Putin could not bet on the yeah. fact, as he did, that we would do nothing. On the other hand, you know, there are people who say that Trump was fully committed to pulling out of NATO in his second term. Right. I don't know if they're I don't know if they're telling the truth and I, I don't know, but in any case, he's no longer our president. And, and, you know, that's one of the invidious comparisons I find very unappealing. Joe Biden is our president and he's doing a terrible job on this. He's doing a terrible job. So how so? Well, just look, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm very impressed that NATO has finally woken up and smelled the coffee after 20 plus years of disinvestment in national defense and in the alliance itself. Now, even though in the post-Cold War era, um, the, the, the alliance expanded, allowed in a whole variety of other countries, the reality is that the mainstays of NATO most of them never met their commitment that they made in 2014 to in fact, and I'm sorry, recommitted in 2014 to, to spend 2% of GDP on defense. Okay, very few of them did it. Yeah. Not to speak of the fact that Turkey, one of the mainstays and one of the original members of, of NATO, not, not just didn't uh, stand up to the values uh, of NATO, uh, there's a dictatorship currently in Turkey, but in addition, went out and bought Russian weaponry that is directly used, directly used, to counter NATO weaponry. So, you know, they went out and bought the S-400 um, uh, anti-aircraft system. Now, at the time, the Trump administration, again, the Trump administration suspended their membership, Turkey's membership in the F-35 program. Okay. I doubt that would have happened under any other administration. Mm. What is Biden doing wrong now? So mm. Biden and I would say our European allies as well, while they take very seriously what's happening in Ukraine, while they take very seriously the threats that Putin is uttering, at the same time, they seem to view this all as a ratchet. You know, here, let's start with a little bit. And then if he doesn't take it seriously, 
we'll add some more. And then if it doesn't take it seriously, we'll add even more. That's not the way to handle this. Okay, The right way to handle this would have been, A, to hit him with the book right up front, cut up, cut off Russian energy sales. Yep, it would have caused a cold, few cold living rooms. It would have hurt us at the pump, but we're already hurting at the pump. Okay, that's part one. Part two is to help the Ukrainians help themselves. I think that I cannot think of a single human being that has looked at how Ukraine and Ukrainians have fought and stood against Russians and not been absolutely slack jawed with admiration, right? They're incredible. But why is it that Zelensky has to go out with a tin hat begging, begging for weaponry, begging for support? He should be getting that. He should, we should be ramming it down their throats. Take this, take this, fight harder, sock it to them because we need them to win. And that seems to elude the Biden administration for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. Yeah. Um, how, how much of it is part of a larger worldview that the Biden administration and the Obama administration have on um the Middle East too. I mean, how much of it is is really an ideological position where uh, American power really shouldn't be exerted that much? We should pull back from the world. Um, a certain almost uh, embarrassment about what we what we've stood for in the world. How much of it is that? You know, look. Um... There are a lot of louche accusations uh, against the, the the Biden administration. I've known Biden for yeah, actually this year it's thirty years, uh, a very long time. Uh, you know, I think he loves America. I, I think he believes in American leadership and American power. Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think he runs his administration, at least not with a very tight hand. Yeah. I, there are people around him who. I, I don't I don't want to say that they don't love America because I think it's first of all, I think it's a pointless accusation. Um, I think that they believe that America has not done good in the world. Right. And um, and I think that they believe that even on the soft power side, our ability to do good is very limited. No, I don't I don't agree with that. Actually, I think we could do a lot. I do think that we have become extraordinarily incompetent. Mm -hmm. And you see that incompetent play, incompetence play out in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in Egypt and Lebanon. And, and you know, this, this is your part of the world and my part of the world, the Middle East. Yeah. So, you know, I focus on it. But I'm sure anyone who does Latin America or Africa, anywhere, Asia, would say the same thing, which is maybe good intentions, but not terribly effective in the application of, of, of soft power. Okay. But the right question there is, okay, why isn't this working? It's not, gee, we kind of suck. We should stop doing this, which is what I hear all the time from sort of millennials on down. And that's the problem. These are the people who are now staffing up this administration. People wow. who believe not that we have been occasionally incompetent, but that in fact, we are just bad at it. And yeah. so we shouldn't do it. And then there's the additional thing that you alluded to, which is a kind of the, the pathetic who are we to tell them how to be? I mean, think of the moral stains on our background. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, I, mean, I think we think the same thing about this. Yeah. So what about the Afghanistan pullout? Do you think that the fact that it was so obviously a moral failure, a strategic failure, um, do you sense in Washington from Democrats and the administration any sense of, yeah, we really screwed it up? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I think there are Democrats who think that. Um, but I think the Democrats who think that think that we screwed up the withdrawal, not that we did the wrong thing. Right, right. 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 And yet, if you ask those self-same Democrats, why do we still have troops in Germany? What about Japan? Mm -hmm. Korea, Italy, 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 Spain, not to speak of Korea and everywhere else. Why do we have them there? Because we they've been there since the war, since World War II, since the Korean War, you know, and the reason that they're there is because they help protect, they help deter, um, and because the hosts want them there. That was very much the case in Afghanistan as well. 
Yeah. And, um, and, and I think there is an astonishing lack of willingness to understand just what a debacle this yes. was. And I don't just mean the drawdown. If you are a person, and so many in this administration are, that insists that, that he or she cares about women's rights, <laughs> okay? You and I, we're two women, right? We care about women's rights. Okay, what the hell were you thinking in Afghanistan? I mean, seriously, Absolutely. women and girls oppressed, raped, murdered, no school, no work. How is this a blow for women's freedom? Those people should be ashamed of themselves. Well said, well said. And when you look at, thank you. When you look at the Middle East, um, what are you most concerned about? And perhaps it is about Afghanistan and the spillover effects, but what are you, what, what do you see? You know, look, Mariam, I really wish I could say that I was just concerned about one thing. I'm concerned about a lot of things, mm -hmm. and they range from the, the sublime to the ridiculous. You know, I am deeply concerned, obviously, about Iran's increasing aggression, Iran, Iran's um, almost wanton uh, um, aggression against various people uh, around the region, mm -hmm. but even more importantly, perhaps against its own people. Mm -hmm. um, I am profoundly concerned uh, about the stability of Iran. I have friends who say, oh no, everything would be great if only the Ayatollahs would go away. I'm not entirely persuaded that's true, but I worry about them. I worry about their proxy forces. I worry about uh, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, no one talks about Lebanon and what a debacle that is. Yes. I worry about their, their proxy forces, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, the Hashda Shabi, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq. We could go on and on and on yes. about what a problem Iran is. I worry about their nuclear weapons program. I worry about their missile program. I worry about proliferation from Iran. So all of that. But if only that were all we could worry about, we could just sort of focus like a laser on Tehran and really address it. The problem is we can't just focus. We talked about Turkey. Turkey's headed in a terrible direction. We have two um, nostalgic powers, one for the Persian greatness of yesteryear and the other for Ottoman greatness of yesteryear. By the way, neither of them were that great if you're an historian, but nonetheless, these are, um, these are, are leaders who feel that they have a destiny to fulfill. By the way, ditto with Xi Jinping, ditto mm -hmm. with Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. these sort of um, apocalyptic um, nationalist, um, em, you know, emperor wannabes in these capitals are really a big danger to us. Then, um, then, you know, I don't need to stop there. I worry about, I worry about the increasing extremism of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, I don't worry about that because I think it's bad for Israel. It's bad for Israel, but Israel can defend itself. I worry about it because I actually care about the Palestinians. And they have seen their fortunes diminish, dwindle, their hopes decline and decline and decline. And it is not because of the Jews. It is because of their leadership in Ramallah. I worry about Egypt. We never talk about it. Led by a dictator who is 10 times worse than Hosni Mubarak, but he's our dictator. So yay. The stability of the Jordanian government. I worry about where mm -hmm. I, I, I have less antipathy towards him than many, but I worry about where Mohammed bin Salman is taking uh, Saudi Arabia. I worry about Al-Qaeda, Islamism, ISIS, uh, Yemen. Jesus, I worry about shipping. We could go on. I could just go on in a stream of consciousness it's about so, the problem. It's also true, and it's hardly an exaggeration is, is, is the difficult thing. Do you think that from de democratic countries, not just the United States, there's any sense of we need to have a holistic, comprehensive policy to treat the Middle East? Or is it all piecemeal? And even the piecemeal is very weak, particularly on Iran. You see me shaking my head. And the reason you see me shaking my head is we don't we don't have any serious policies. We are um, no. we, we've become very uh, willing to address everything scattershot. Everything is a surprise and to reactive. us. Ooh. Yeah. You know, just everything react. is reactive. But just I just let me give you one perfect example because everybody will understand it. The Biden administration did a great job. Um, sharing intel about what Russia's plans for Ukraine were. 
right? We heard it every day before the invasion. They're coming. This is what they're planning. This is how they're intending to hit them. These are the excuses they're going to make. And they were calling them out. It was a great information operation. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. there we have it. We're showing. We know you. We see you. We have intel on you. Okay. So that's great. Good for them. And then the invasion happens and it's like, oh my God, you invaded <laughs> Ukraine? But that is in fact the way it is with everything, right? right? It's not that we don't know it. It's not that we don't see it. It's that despite that fact, we seem eternally surprised. Yeah. The and irony, it, right. The irony right. is that over these years, since the end of the Cold War, the American bureaucracy has grown and grown and grown. And yet the preparedness and plan strategic planning and awareness seems to have have uh, lessened and lessened. I mean, when I look at Iran, what I'm most concerned about is the day after uh, uh, regime collapse or regime overthrow and the fact that, you know, it seems like the democratic countries of the world are just going to wait and see. Well, you know, <laughs> this is, yes. uh, it's, it's really is not disconcerting. A, hope, is, hope is not a foreign policy. Yes. yes. Um, right. And, and that, that's really it. I mean, you know, the world is a better place when, uh, when we try to shape its destiny, the world is a better place when our morals are the fundamental guides to what yeah. a good foreign policy is. And, uh, you're exactly right. Um, we are completely reactive everywhere. Yeah. You are also obviously, uh, an expert on defense. Um, could you say a bit before we close, um, about how Western countries, about NATO, how how our military preparedness is also affecting our foreign policy readiness. So, you know, again, I, I thank you for calling me an expert on defense. I wouldn't call myself an expert on defense by any standard. I'm surrounded by people who really know what they're doing in that regard um, at, at, uh, at the American Enterprise Institute. But look, you know, anybody can understand that if you spend less on defense and you spend less year in, year out, year in and year out, you have declines, not simply in readiness, but you have declines in force structure. You have declines in ability. We do not have enough ships. We don't have enough aircraft carriers. We are operating sometimes with decades, sometimes um, technology that is older than me uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the Air Force, the Navy. Uh, you know, our army is is ill equipped, uh, unable to bounce back, and we now don't even have a two war doctrine. We have a one war doctrine, which is what the Pentagon operates under. So if two bad things happen, we're screwed because we can't fight two wars at the same time. And when I look at the world out there, I say to myself, perhaps a responsible president would do something about that. Now, I will say in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you do see the willingness to spend more on defense. The problem is with 7% inflation and, and you know heading up, we're actually having an effective cost cut once again. Yeah. And everyone gets it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Danny, well, so grateful for your time, um, all this expertise. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. And um, again, thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you all for uh, watching. And again, soon we will be available as a podcast. And of course, send your uh, recommendations and suggestions. Thank you again. Thank you.